Good morning, everybody. Uh, good to see you all. Brilliant to see you on this. Well, I said, I said to everyone outside, it's not really a good morning, it's a grim morning. It's so wet and so cold. Spring has kind of sprung and gone, but hopefully it'll be back soon. But great to see you all. And if you're here for the first time, my name is Marty. I'm the minister here. And it's just great that you've joined us this morning at church as we come to worship God. But that's why we are here this morning. We're here to meet with God. So let's take a moment of stillness together as we set ourselves to do that. Almighty God, we live in a world of constant change. Nothing stays the same forever. Nothing remains as it was for all time. But you do, Lord, because you are the unchanging God. You are the only one who will never change or be changed. This morning, Lord, as we come to worship you, may we acknowledge that as you have always been, you are today. You're holy, good, righteous, kind, merciful, loving, gracious, sovereign, powerful, and a million other things. And so today, Lord, as we gather here, Maybe we're frightened by some of the changes that we see in our world. Maybe we're frightened by some of the changes that we see in our lives. But may we find comfort today and hope today as we worship you, the unchanging God. Come and meet with us this morning, we pray, by the power of your Spirit, that we would leave here knowing that we have met with you, the one true and living God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Psalm 50, it begins with the words, Hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. And it says this, praise the Lord, praise him for his acts of power, praise him for his surpassing greatness, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. This morning, if you have breath, and it looks to me like you all do, then you and I were called this morning to praise the Lord. So let's stand together and sing Psalm 150, praise the Lord. Let's stand and sing together.
well. Let's continue to praise God with a prayer as we pray to him with praise and also confess our sins. Let's pray together. Loving and changing God, we are so glad that although you never change, you bring change. Thank you, Lord, that you change the course of history, that you change the destiny of nations, and that you change the lives of normal, ordinary people like us, who you have created precious in your sight. We thank you, God, today for the ways that you have moved in so many people's lives across the years. We praise you for how you have met with individuals right where they are in their life and changed their lives for the better. We remember Jacob, a trickster and a cheat. We remember Matthew, a tax collector who was hated. We remember Legion, feared as a madman. We remember Paul, formerly a persecutor of the church. And we remember today, Lord, how each of them experienced a life-changing moment, a vision of a ladder to heaven, a call to discipleship, a pronouncement of healing, a blinding light. Just one touch from your hand. One word from your mouth, and their lives were never the same again. And we thank you, Lord, for the ways that you are changing those of us who have put our trust in your son, Jesus. We praise you for developing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We praise you for making us a new creation. We praise you for transforming us into the image of your son. And we praise you too this morning, Lord, that you can change anyone. However impossible that might seem, we praise you that the hardest of hearts and the most twisted of people can be overcome by your grace and moved to turn away from their past life and towards a new life with you. But loving God, we confess this morning that sometimes we lose sight of your transforming power. Sometimes we become cynical, disillusioned and frustrated by our repeated failures and disheartened by the continuing evil in our life and the heartache that's in our world. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to remember that whether we see it or whether we don't, you are still present, you are still fulfilling your purposes, and you're still able to surprise us by the way you change what seems unchangeable. Oh, never-changing God, we praise you that you're the one who can change people's lives. Help us to glory and revel in that truth this morning. In Jesus' name. This morning, maybe you're here, and as I prayed that prayer, maybe you're sitting here thinking, you know what, Marty, I don't know if I've changed very much. The fruit of the Spirit, I'm not sure it displays very much in my life. Being more like Jesus, sometimes I feel so far from Jesus, it's scary. Well, listen to this truth this morning from God's Word. From 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, and the new is here. This morning, if you're in Christ, if you've trusted in Christ, then you are a new creation. No matter what progress or lack of progress you've made, if you're in Christ, you're one of God's people, and you belong to him today, all because of his grace and mercy. So don't lose heart this morning, but delight that Christ has made you one of the family. We're going to stand together and sing again. Let's stand together and sing Light of the World, remembering that we're here this morning to worship God.
few announcements this morning. So the first is that we're going to gather tonight at 7 p.m. And we're delighted that John is back, and John will be leading tonight and preaching for us, and it'll be just great to be encouraged by what he shares with us. So that's tonight at 7. Also, on Wednesday night, we're meeting in person to pray together. That's going to be over in the church halls in the prayer room. And if you're free on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, come along for an hour as we pray for our church family, for our local community, and also for the world that we live in. And also, we had some really good times at the Spiritual Conversation Workshops. If you missed Workshop 3, um, I think it's maybe maybe the most important of the three workshops. If you missed that and you would like that to be rerun so you can attend, would you just text me to let me know? And if we get enough people wanting to do that, we'll run it. And if not, well, then you'll miss out. Uh, and, and then the last, also just to say, it's been really encouraging. Um, a, a lot of churches over kind of COVID and over lockdown have declined. And we somehow have grown. And there's a number of people here who got connected online and have started coming to church and now really are part of the furniture. And then if that's you and you would like to become a full member of the church, can you let me know and we can talk about exploring that and what that means and how you go about that. As well, there's some of you, and you've maybe been here for years, but God has opened up your eyes and your heart and you've become a follower of Christ. And again, if that's you and you would now like to become a communicant member of the church, would you just let me know and we can explore that together? And ideally, I'd love to be welcoming people into membership on Easter Sunday. So if that's you, send me a message, speak to me out the front, let me know, and then we can work towards that um, for Easter Sunday. But this morning we're going to turn again to, to the book of Acts. And we're going to turn to Acts chapter 16. And if you take a Bible, it's on page 1111. So 1111. And this morning we're going to read from verses 1 through to 34. So Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 34. This is God's word. So the he mentioned, just so you know, is the Apostle Paul. If you remember last time, he'd been on a missionary journey. Uh, and this time we're going to pick up another journey of Paul's. So he says this. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where, the, where a disciple named Timothy lived. His mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they travelled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Tyrathyra, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. 
She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains became loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew a sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. This is God's word. We're going to look at it together in just a moment, so please do keep it open. But before we do that, let's sing together, Worthy is the Lamb. Sorry, living hope. I've got the song.
Father, we come to your word, the Bible now, aware of our need, our need of understanding, our need of interpretation, and our need of application. So we look from ourselves now to the enabling of your Holy Spirit. We would pray that you would grant that we would hear your voice through my little voice this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1994, Cheryl Crow released a song that was called A Change Would Do You Good. And this morning, if you fall asleep during this sermon and you remember nothing else, all I want you to remember is that Jesus changes us for our good. A change would do you good. One of the things we see about Jesus is that he changes people's lives. He utterly transforms them. And my guess is that you know some people and you know what they were like before they met Jesus and you know what they're like having met Jesus and it's like chalk and cheese. They are completely different people. There has been radical transformation. They're a bit like Saul to Paul. They met Jesus and their lives were completely and utterly changed. And I think sometimes when we think of Jesus changing people, that's the type of change we think of, isn't it? Big, radical, massive, huge transformation. But Jesus isn't just in the business of this big, massive type of change. No, Jesus is also in the business of changing people's lives in little tiny ways that make a huge difference to them. I don't know if you've ever heard of the butterfly effect. But it's this idea that the flapping of a butterfly's wings, just this little flapping of wings, hypothetically could change the course of a tornado two or three weeks later. The butterfly effect is this idea that a little tiny thing can have a big, huge, massive consequence. And this morning as we explore Acts chapter 16, we're going to see Jesus make a little tiny change in people's lives, which has a huge and massive difference to their lives. A good difference, a positive difference, a wonderful difference. A change would do you good. So let's meet the first person that Jesus changed this morning. And we find him at the start of Acts chapter 16. He's a man called Timothy. He's a young man, he's maybe 19, 20, he's in his early 20s probably. And he is a young man who lives in a city called Lystra. Now, last week, we saw Paul visit Lystra. Paul had gone there to tell people about Jesus, and it had all gone horribly wrong. If you were here last week, you remember that he healed the man, and the people of the time, they started worshipping him like a god. And it was like he couldn't get the message of Jesus out. The trip to Lystra had been, Paul had thought, a complete and utter disaster. But it turns out, it wasn't such a disaster after all. Because about a year later, Paul is back in Lystra, and he meets a young man called Timothy. And if you have a look at the text, you'll see how he's described. He is described as a disciple. Timothy is a disciple of Jesus. Timothy must have somehow heard the message that Paul brought to Lystra. And Timothy believed it and put his faith in Christ. As a preacher, this really encourages me. You know, Paul's sermon had been a disaster in Lystra, but yet God used it in someone's life. And he used it in the life of Timothy. And if you have a look at Timothy, we're told a little bit about him in the passage. So we're told that his mother was a Jewess, but his father was a Greek. So his mother, she was a Jew by birth. She was brought up knowing the teachings of the Bible. She was brought up believing in one true living God. She was brought up following the Ten Commandments. She was brought up following the ethical rules of the Bible. She was someone who knew God and who knew the scriptures and who was waiting for the rescuer, God's promised Messiah, to come. That was Timothy's mother. But his father... Well, he was the exact opposite. He, we're told in the passage, was a Greek. 
He didn't believe that there was one true God. He believed in probably many gods. He didn't believe in the ethics or the morals of the Old Testament. He believed that the Greek and Roman morals were the way to live. He, Timothy's mother and Timothy's father, they believed completely different things. Timothy's mother and father, they were a mixed marriage. Uh, and their views of God and religion and morals were very, very different. But Timothy's mother, Timothy's mother continued to teach Timothy the scriptures as a child. We find that out later whenever Paul writes letters to Timothy down the line. She invested in her son. Even though his father wasn't a believer, she invested in her son and she taught him the scriptures. And she taught him about the coming rescuer. She taught him about how to live God's way. Timothy grew strong in his faith and then whenever Jesus, when he heard about Christ, he responded. And this morning I point that out, not just because it's in the passage, but I point it out by way of encouragement to those of you who maybe have children and your spouse is not a believer. I know that's the case for some of you. In your house, you're the one who's the Christian and, and your husband and your wife, they're not. And it's difficult at times and there's a clash sometimes and you have different ideas sometimes. But I want to encourage you, continue to teach your children the Bible, continue to bring them out to church, continue to point them to Jesus. Continue to build them up in their faith. So that like Timothy, they can come to faith in Christ at the time that is right. So anyway, here he is, Timothy. He lives in Lystra, he's a believer in Christ, his life is good, he's a man of good reputation. But Paul, whenever he comes to Timothy, he wants to do something. Paul wants to take Timothy with him on the next missionary journey. Paul wants to bring him on the next phase of the mission. And so Paul invites him. Hey Timothy. Not sure what your life is like here in Lystra. Not sure what commitments you've got here. But do you fancy coming with me on this next mission trip? Do you fancy coming to me to the next town? Do you fancy joining us for a few days or a few weeks? Do you want to come with us, Timothy? Paul invited Timothy simply to go with him. And Timothy went. Now listen, that's just a small thing, isn't it? It's just an invitation. It was just an invitation to this young man. Do you want to come with me and see what happens? A very small thing. And yet it has a massive impact on Timothy's life. You see, when Timothy leaves with Paul, he never actually goes back to Lystra properly. He doesn't go back to living with his mother and his grandmother. No, Timothy goes on and he is made stronger in his faith and he's discipled by Paul and Timothy ends up telling people about Jesus all over Europe and then starting a church and pastoring it for the rest of his life. Do you see what Jesus did? Jesus took this very small thing, this little invitation and he used it to change Timothy's life in a way that he couldn't have imagined before. Jesus used that small thing to do something significant and meaningful and huge in Timothy's life. This morning I just want to say this, do not underestimate the power of an invitation. Do not underestimate the power of an invitation. An invitation to church, an invitation to the men's group, an invitation to Christianity Explored, an invitation to something the women are doing. Do not underestimate the power of an invitation because Jesus can take that little tiny thing and he can use it to transform and do something great in people's lives. Just as a side note, something else that happened with Timothy was that he gained the father he never had. Timothy's father was a Greek. He 
He wasn't a spiritual man. He wasn't a believer. And, and, and we probably can read into this what said that, that his father died. But when Timothy went with Paul, he also gained this spiritual father. And again, later on in the New Testament, when he writes to Timothy, he calls him my true son in the faith. Timothy got a family out of this invitation and not just a new purpose. But the first person we meet is Timothy. And from this invitation, he had a life-changing purpose given to him. The next person that we meet is in a place called Philippi. Philippi, if you look at it on a map today, it's in Greece. And so Paul and Timothy and Luke and a, and a group of the people, they go to Philippi. And they get there and they're looking for a synagogue to go and tell people about Jesus. But they can't find one. There's no synagogue in this city. And so they hear that there's a river and that they hear by the river people go on the Sabbath and they pray together. So Paul and the companions and Timothy, they head down to the river. And when they get there, they find a group of women praying together. Have a look at verse 13 with me. On the Sabbath, they went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. So they go to Philippi, and they're down by the river, and there's this group of women, and they're praying together. And we're told that there's a lady there, a particular lady, and her name is Lydia. And we can read about her in verse 14. Have a look with me there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Tyrathira, who was a worshipper of God. So have a look at what we find out about this lady. She was a dealer in purple cloth. This lady was a businesswoman. She was a woman of means. She had a good income. She had her own business. She dealt in purple cloth. And do you know who purple cloth was sold to? It was sold to royalty. She's probably providing Caesar's household with the royal cloth for their robes. Here is this affluent business lady at this place of prayer. And if you have a look at the end of the description in verse 14, You'll see, see that she is called a worshipper of God. Now, you have to understand this. Lydia was not like Timothy's mom. Lydia was not born as a Jew. She hadn't grown up with the scriptures. She hadn't grown up teaching, with the teaching of the Old Testament. She hadn't grown up knowing the Ten Commandments. She hadn't grown up believing this stuff about God that's found in the Bible. But yet she found herself drawn to him. She found herself believing that the God of the Bible was the one true God. She hadn't grown up like this, but she found herself drawn to God. But Lydia had a problem. She just wasn't sure that she really belonged. She wasn't sure that God really accepted her. She wasn't sure that she really was one of God's people. She felt drawn to God, but she just wasn't sure she really belonged to him. I wonder, is that you this morning? I wonder, is that you as you sit here? You come to church and you're regular here. You find yourself drawn towards God. You worship him, you, you believe in him, but you're just not sure that you belong to him. You're not really sure if you're a Christian. You're not really sure if you're in the family. Or maybe you've been there before and you know how Lydia feels. Well, this is her at the riverside. Drawn to God but unsure whether she really belongs. But Jesus, Jesus changes that in her. Because what happened next? is that Paul, he opens his mouth and he tells Lydia and the women standing there the good news, the great news, the wonderful news. The wonderful news that if you put your faith in Christ and trust in him as the forgiver of your sin, then God does something wonderful and he brings you into the family. He adopts you as his own. Paul preached the gospel, the good news that you didn't have to earn and be a part of the family. You didn't have to pay to get into the family. 
But simply by trusting in Christ, you were brought in to God's family. Do you remember how John 1 starts? We looked at it at Christmas. It says, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. That's the message that Paul preached. And if you have a look at the text, what you'll see is that the Lord opened up her heart to respond to Paul's message. She put her trust in Jesus. She was brought in to the family. And then what did she do next? Again, looking for assurance, she asked him to baptize her. Listen, will you baptize me? Baptism, it's a, it's a sign that we belong to the family. We baptize children in our church, if their parents are Christians, to say that they belong to the family of God and will be brought up in that way. We baptize adults who come to faith in Christ. They're baptized as adults to, to say publicly that they now belong, that they're part of the people of God. And here Lydia is baptized. And as she comes out of the water, there's that assurance. I now belong. But she's still a bit nervous. And so she says to Paul, look at the end of verse 15. Verse 15 she says, and when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into her home. And she said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. Listen, Paul, can you just, can you just confirm? Can you just confirm that I really do belong? And come and stay with me just to show that I really belong. That you consider me a sister in Christ. And she persuaded them and they went. This morning, if you're unsure, this morning, if you don't have that assurance and you want it, all you need to do is trust in Christ. Lean on Him for the forgiveness of your sin. Lean on Him to bring you into the family of God. All who believe in him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. And if you are unsure and you want to have a chat about that, you've got my number, give me a call, send me a text, we'll meet for coffee, we'll have a discussion about it. If you're unsure and you want to be sure, don't leave it today, but respond if the Lord has opened up your heart. Let's move on to the next person we meet. We're on to person three or four, but don't worry, the last two are shorter than the first two, so we'll not be here past half twelve, don't panic. Uh, but let's look at the next one. The next lady then, it's this slave girl. Um, the situation in Ukraine, it, it's awful, isn't it? It's heartbreaking. But last Sunday night, on the way out of church, a lady stopped me, and she told me something that, that broke my heart even more for what's going on. She told me that she's aware of pastors in Romania, and she was saying that these pastors were saying that in Romania, gangs were coming to the border. Trafficking gangs. And they were taking women and children, pretending that they're offering them a place to stay, and instead trafficking them into Europe to be slaves. Evil upon evil. And then I read in the papers this week, I looked a bit about that, and it's happening in all the countries. These Ukrainian women and these Ukrainian children are fleeing from the horror of war. And there are evil men trafficking them into Europe to be slaves. They're being exploited. They're having their freedom taken away. They're being trapped. And it's horrible. Well, here in Acts chapter 16, we meet a girl who is in a similar position. This girl is possessed by a demon. There is an unclean spirit. There is a demonic force that lives within her. And can I explain that? No, I can't. I don't understand that. It's hard for me to get my head around, but this is what the passage tells us. That there was a spirit that had enslaved her. So she'd been enslaved by this demonic spirit. And the Spirit gave her the ability to tell the future. And so having had this ability, she was then enslaved by these horrible men. Men who exploited her. Men who made money from her. Men who controlled her. In 
Philippi, there is this poor slave girl. And we read about her in verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners. Do you notice? Not for her. She earned money for her owners. She was poor and exploited by them. Verse 17. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be seen. She's telling the truth. I'm not sure why the spirit that was in her was saying this, but it was. She follows them around. These men are here to tell you how to be saved. Anyway, verse 18 tells us that she kept this up for many days. She followed them around, constantly saying this. Must have been a bit annoying after a while. It doesn't tell us that, but what it does tell us is that Paul became so troubled in verse 18 that he turned around and he said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And then look what happened. At that moment, the Spirit left her. Do you see what Jesus does for this girl? He sets her free. Jesus brings this girl a freedom that she had never had for years and years and years. Jesus set her free. And friends, that's what Jesus has come to do. He's come to set people free. Paul writing to the Galatians, he says this, he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Jesus has come to set people free. What's he come to set us free from? Well, I think one thing he's come to set us free from is having to, to keep up with the demands of the world around us. It's exhausting, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but the world around us, it lays demands on us and it tells us that we have to meet these demands or else we're worthless. We have to keep up with the Joneses. We have to keep buying stuff. We have to keep buying the best stuff. We have to, to keep up appearances. That's draining and demanding, isn't it? But when we follow Jesus, he says, do you know what? You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses. You don't have to live to get stuff anymore. You're free from that. You're free to live for me. And then there's the keeping up of appearances, isn't there? Pretending we've got it all together. Pretending that we're really good people. Pretending that we're morally wonderful. Pretending that our mental health is perfect. That's what society says we have to do. And it's exhausting too, isn't it? Because we're not perfect, we're flawed. But we feel we have to put on a show. And our mental health isn't great, but we feel we have to say it is. Jesus says... You're free from that. I've come to save sinners. So you can just admit you are one. I've came for flawed people so you don't have to pretend you're not flawed anymore. I've come for the sick so you don't have to pretend that your mind is always in a good place. You're free. You're free. Jesus also comes to free us from having to obey every desire within us. You know, there's this idea that if we feed something, we have to go with it. That's what society says. If you feel a certain way, if you feel like doing something, you just got to go with it. Trust your feelings, trust your instincts. But Jesus says you don't have to. You don't have to. You're free to follow me instead. And then there's the devil himself. He tempts us. He tempts us to sin. He, he tempts us to go against God. He, he tempts us to do and say and think certain things. And he tells us, you have to follow me. You have to do this. But Jesus says, you're free to say no. You're free. Following Jesus is not becoming bound up 
It's not losing our freedom. It's being free to be the people that we're really meant to be. Free to follow him. Free from the world's demands. Free from the demands of our feelings. Free from the demands of the evil one. And this young girl, she was set free simply through the words of Paul casting the demon out of her. Let's move on to our final friend, the jailer. And I don't know anybody, and, and maybe you do, I don't know anybody whenever they were a child said to their mom and dad, do you know what mom and dad, when I grew up, I want to be a prison officer. I, I don't know anybody who has said that. Because to be a prison officer is such a difficult and demanding and joy-killing job, isn't it? You have to deal with arguments, you have to deal with threats, you have to deal with violence, you have to deal with intimidation. You have to deal with men who have done really evil things. And you have to face them and live amongst them. Being a prison officer, it is a demanding difficult job and I could be wrong but I don't imagine there is a whole lot of joy in it and here in Acts chapter 16 we meet a jailer uh, Paul and, uh, and his friends they've they've cast this demon out of the girl the men who are exploiting her aren't too happy he's lost us our income so they lock Paul and Silas up in prison and the jailer he's given one job make sure these guys don't escape so he puts them in the stocks, very uncomfortably, he puts them in the inner cell, and they are in prison. This man, who I guess probably hates his job, is just doing what he's told. And he's in there, and it's coming up to midnight, and uh, Paul and Silas, they start singing. They start singing and they start praying. And they're not singing and they're not playing quietly. They're, they're singing and praying in such a way that everybody can hear them. That's what the text says. All the other prisoners are listening to them. You can imagine the, the, the soldier, the, the jailer scratch says, why on earth are these men singing? What have they got to sing about? What have they got to be happy about? What have they got to be joyful about? But as he listens, he hears that they're singing hymns. Songs of praise to God. These men in the stocks, in the prison, they have a joy from God that this jailer just cannot understand. The jailer, he eventually falls asleep. But then he's woken up by a shaking. There's an earthquake. And, and he wakes up and he panics because the doors have opened and the chains have fallen off. And the jailer thinks he's in massive trouble because the prisoners will have escaped. And we're told that the, the jailer actually goes to take his life. Worried about the consequences. He goes to take his life. But Paul starts out, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Don't do it, we're all here, we haven't run away. We're still here. The jailer calls for the lights and the lights are switched on, you know, the torches come. And he looks around in disbelief that they are all still here. And he turns to Paul, he turns to Silas, and he, he has this question, and I'm not even sure he understood it. He probably just heard the slave girl telling him, these men are here to tell you how to be saved. And he turns to them and he says, what must I do to be saved? You guys have got something. I don't know why you didn't run away. I should be dead, I should have killed myself because they're here and you stay. What have I got to do to be saved? And the answer is so simple. Paul just says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And then he follows up, we're told that he, he goes to the man's home and they explain a bit more about Jesus to him. And the man's heart is changed. He washes their wounds from where he's beaten them or he's tied them up. And then if you have a look at the last verse, if you have a look with me at verses 33 to 34, you'll see what happened to this man. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. 
Then immediately he and his family were baptized. So again, he's become a believer. He's put his faith in Jesus. He's become one of God's people through this event. Verse 34, the jailer brought them into his house and set a meeting before them. And then look at this for a beautiful end of the story. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. He was filled with joy. He still had to go back to work on Monday morning. Life as a prison officer was still going to be difficult and grim and hard. His life wasn't really going to be very different in many ways. But there was one difference. And the difference was that this man now carried around an unshakable joy. He carried a joy in his heart that couldn't be taken away by the circumstances of life. And what brought this joy was that he and his family had come to know and believe in God. Jesus brings joy. Jesus can bring a joy that no one else can. Jesus assures us that we belong to God. And if we can get that into our hearts and our minds, we, like the jailer, can carry around an unshakable, unchangeable joy. Friends, Jesus changes lives. And this morning as you sit here, I just have a, a number of questions for you. The first one is this, will you let him change yours? If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian yet, if you've not put your faith in Jesus yet, and you know that you need a change of life, maybe you need a freedom like the slave girl had. Maybe you need a purpose like Timothy got. Maybe you need joy like the jailer. Maybe you need assurance like Lydia. If you can relate to these changes and you need them in your life and you don't know how to get them, when you let Jesus bring that change, when you put your trust in him and let him into your life, that he might change you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, and anyone who opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. Jesus stands at the door of your heart today, and he's knocking, and he's saying, will you let me in? Will you let me into Jesus? If that's you, will you let him in this morning? Maybe you're here this morning and, and you know other people, friends, family, and they need the things that Timothy and the slave girl and Lydia got. They need those things this morning. Your friends and your family members, and they, they have no sense of purpose in their life. They're drifting through and they feel lost. Or your friends and family members and they are trapped by addiction or they're trapped by something that's got them in the grip of it and they can't get out. If that's you this morning, will you pray for God to change them through Christ? Will you pray for change this morning? Maybe you're sitting here and it's something else that you need to do. Maybe you can relate to Timothy or the slave girl or Lydia or the jailer. Maybe you're here and you can say, do you know what, Marty, I'm sitting here and I recognize those changes. And I've experienced them. But will you thank God and praise God today for those? And will you do something else? Will you tell people? Will you tell people how Christ has changed you? And will you pray that Christ might change them? A change would do you good. A change would do us all good. And the unchangeable God, the one who never changes through the gospel of his son, is in the business of changing lives. Let's cling to this truth today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the ways that you have changed us. Thank you for
for adopting us into your family. Thank you for setting us free from any of the things that ensnared us. Thank you for giving us a joy that we belong to you. Thank you, Lord, for the ways that you have changed us. And Father, would you help us to believe that you can change other people and that you can do them good through the gospel of your son, Jesus. Help us to cling to this truth and to believe it with our hearts and to live with it in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand together and sing our closing hymn. Worthy is the Lamb.